Hi there, it's me, Denise Howell, and next up on This Week in Law, we've got professors. Number one, Mark Lemley from Stanford. Number two, Eric Johnson from the University of North Dakota. Evan Brown and I are going to ask them about current developments in patent law. We're going to talk about the Immigration Enforcement Service and how they're taking domain names. And we're going to talk about WIPO and how Boyka creeps us out next on Twill. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell. Episode 92, recorded December 17th, 2010. Time-traveling patent trolls. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by MailRoute. Businesses of every size use MailRoute. One user, 50,000 users, doesn't matter. MailRoute will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life, and make your email usable again. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up. Hello and welcome to This Week in Law. I'm Denise Howell. We're here for our year-end episode, the last episode of 2010, and we have a great panel with us to round out the year. Joining us from his office in San Francisco, Dury Tongri, is Stanford Law Professor Mark Lemley. Hello, Mark. Hi. Great to have you on the show. You have been one of these people that has been, you know, on my aspirational guest list for a very long time. So I'm thrilled to have been able to coordinate schedules and uh, actually get to chat with you virtually via Skype here on This Week in Law. Well, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Also joining us uh, for a return visit, we have not one law professor today, but two. We have Eric Johnson from the University of North Dakota School of Law. Hello, Eric. Hi. How are you doing today? Thanks for coming back to share your wit and wisdom with us. And of course, joining us as well is Evan Brown from Hinshaw and Culbertson in Chicago. Hello, Evan. How's it going, Denise? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Happy end of the year. Yes, same to you. Um, Mark, I wanted to start out with you since you've been um, working on a really interesting case going before the Supreme Court, the uh, I4I, if I'm saying that right, versus Microsoft case, which is going to have the court review the presumption of validity in patent cases. That seems like an incredibly large issue to me if um, patents are going to go from being presumed valid to not presumed valid. Can you uh, tell us a bit about that case and what's at stake? Sure. Uh, So the Microsoft I4I case uh, actually presented a bunch of interesting legal issues. Microsoft got hit with uh, quite a large uh, verdict uh, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, At the Supreme Court, the issue's been narrowed to one question, which is, should we give a strong presumption of validity to a patent even over evidence that we know that the patent office didn't consider. So if the patent office never saw a piece of prior art, never saw a prior publication, uh, should we still nonetheless presume that that patent is valid in light of that uh, prior art and require that the defendants prove the invalidity of that patent by clear and convincing evidence? The U.S. Supreme Court three years ago in the KSR case went out of its way in dictum to suggest that that presumption made no sense. Uh, Nonetheless, the Federal Circuit has continued to apply the presumption, and the Supreme Court, I think, took the case uh, to follow up on its earlier suggestion that the presumption of validity ought to bear some resemblance to what the Patent Office actually did. And uh, so tell us a bit about um, the positions that you're advocating in the case and how you think it should come out and why. Right. I wrote a a brief uh, for a group of law professors urging the court to take the case, which they did. And now I am working on a brief that will uh, try to figure out the right solution. Uh, the, the complication is, I mean, it, do, it doesn't seem to make much sense to say that the patent office ought to get credit for having considered things that we know they didn't even have in front of them. 
Well, on the other hand, we don't want to create a system that just encourages people to throw as much art at the patent office as possible, because then that art is nominally in front of the patent examiner, but because of time constraints, the patent examiner may be unlikely to look at all of it. Uh, so I think the right thing to do is to try to create some sort of a system that gives greater deference to the patent office on things that they've actually considered uh, and talked about in their examination, uh, not simply things that are listed on the patent as having been in front of the office. I'm at Gazy is listening live in our IRC and he says, or she, <laughs> that uh, they are not convinced courts or ju juries really pay attention to the presumption of validity and, and give it much weight. So it might be worth eliminating, eliminating it like in other countries. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it's a very interesting question. We don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. whether or not juries pay any attention to the various uh, burdens of proof. There's some anecdotal evidence to suggest that in criminal cases, the beyond a reasonable doubt standard actually does make a difference at the margin. But the difference between a preponderance of the evidence and clear and convincing evidence might or might not make much difference to a jury. One thing I think it would do, though, is give district judges uh, a bit more comfort at resolving uh, cases that they don't view as particularly close on summary judgment. Right now, it's awfully difficult to get a court to decide before trial that a patented invention is obvious, for example, because they face a high burden of proof. Uh, and changing that burden of proof might actually change the willingness of district judges in appropriate cases to invalidate patents. Thank you, Evan, for clarifying that I'm at KZ is Matt McCarry, who's been on the show before. So appreciate that. Um, uh, let's see, Eric, what do you think of all this? And uh, do, do juries care about this? And, and what's going to happen if the court goes along with Mark's advocacy in this case? Well, it's a good question about whether juries um, care about this. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's not something that I'm aware of good empirical research uh, on the question. I do think that juries pay a lot of attention to the instructions they get and the difference uh, in the words between preponderance of the evidence and clear and convincing evidence, uh, I, I think could make a difference to juries. It can also make a difference in closing arguments as to how lawyers can argue to the jury uh, how, to, uh, how to obey those instructions. Um, I, I uh, read uh, Mark's brief. I thought it was very well done. Um, and uh, I agree uh, in general with uh, the idea that the presumption of validity, it makes sense for it to be limited just to, um, to art that was in front of the court. Uh, the sense among the patent litigation bar is that plaintiffs already have a leg up, uh, a significant leg up when they're coming to court. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious to hear more from Mark about what, what he thinks uh, should be put in in its place. I saw in the interview that he did uh, uh, with um, uh, the guy from uh, IP Watchdog. Uh, Quinn. Gene Quinn. Yeah, that, uh, talked about um, inequitable conduct. Uh, I, 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 for one, think that inequitable, uh, let me just explain what the inequitable conduct doctrine is. The idea with inequitable conduct is that if you committed some uh, wrong in getting your patent, that can later cause your patent to be invalidated in litigation. So if you didn't put all of the prior art in front of the patent office that you knew was relevant when you were prosecuting the patent, when you were applying for it, then that can come back to haunt you in a litigation and cause your entire patent to be invalidated. Uh, my experience litigating patents is that the inequitable conduct doctrine, while it sounds great in principle, and in principle makes a lot of sense in, in terms of its, its uh, moral center, but in, in reality what it does is it makes a ton of stuff discoverable before trial that would otherwise not be discoverable. Now you can start taking depositions of all kinds of people about what the inventor knew at the time and, and where were they and where did they have lunch and let's look at their journals and look at their email. Uh, and um, uh, while good uh, in theory, I think in reality, it drives up the cost of patent litigation immensely 
by uh, making all this stuff discoverable, making all of it arguable, and it's really of tangential relevance to uh, the, uh, the central issues in the patent litigation. Um, and so I think inequitable conduct causes a lot more problems than it solves in terms of getting prior art in front of the examiners. And, and I wondered what Mark thought about inequitable conduct doctrine and how that interacts with what he's talking about in terms of uh, the presumption of validity. Sure. Well, so I agree with you. Um, one of the interesting things, Chris Katropia, Bob and Sampat and I just did a, a study um, that suggests that patent examiners overwhelmingly don't rely on prior art that's submitted uh, by applicants to them, even when that art looks like it's actually uh, of, of significant importance. Um, and so it may be that the concern about inequitable conduct, are people hiding things from the patent office, are they lying to the patent office, uh, is overblown, uh, simply because as a practical matter, if you're hiding something from the patent office, you're wasting your time. Uh, the data suggests you probably ought to just submit the evidence, uh, submit the piece of prior art, uh, and it probably will be ignored by the examiner. Now, I do think there's an interaction between these two doctrines because the risk is that if I, uh, if we say the uh, patent office, uh, patent office decision is presumed valid only over prior art that they actually consider, um, then uh, then people hurl a bunch of art into the office and the patent office doesn't really have time to consider it. So I think a better system would be one that said well, we're going to grant a presumption of validity only to things that the examiner actually talks about or the applicant actually talks about and explains why it's different from the, uh, from the invention. Uh, the problem with that, as Eric points out, is right now, whenever you explain a piece of prior art to the, to the patent office, you're putting yourself at risk for a charge of inequitable conduct that says, oh, you misrepresented uh, what it is that the... Uh, art actually says. So I think in tandem, it, in an ideal world, what you'd do is you'd both uh, uh, ratchet back or maybe even eliminate the doctrine of inequitable conduct, which most other countries in the world don't have, but at the same time say, we're not going to presume a patent is valid uh, unless the patent examiners actually talked about and explained why it is that they think it's patentable over these uh, particular inventions. There is a I don't, case... I Sorry, there, there's yeah, a case I'm, pending in the, in the federal circuit in Therasense right now, which may offer the opportunity for the federal circuit on banc to cut back on the inequitable conduct doctrine. What you're proposing sounds like it would just make patent prosecution much, much, much more difficult, which, you know, uh, it, it's already somewhat time consuming. And, and it sounds like it would fill it with more pitfalls and, uh, and be more time consuming. I'm uh, so I'm a little dubious on it. I agree with your general idea that uh, that uh, the validity doctrine's gone too far. And, and for me, the general concept is just that the federal circuit uh, doesn't want to listen to anything the Supreme Court says. They they <laughs> keep talking about they they uh, love their bright line rules. Uh, the Supreme Court keeps slapping them down. The federal circuit keeps uh, uh, coming up with them or pretending that the Supreme Court hasn't spoken to the topic. Um, so. Uh, uh, I'm dubious on the solution, but I definitely agree with uh, the, your central idea of the petition for cert. Well, so let me let me suggest one thing. So I, I think we're in agreement on the, the relationship between the Supreme Court and the federal circuit. I guess in, in some sense it might make prosecution more complicated. I guess what I would say is the goal ought to be to make prosecution more modular. You don't have to do any of this stuff. You don't have to submit the prior art. Uh, if we got rid of inequitable conduct, you wouldn't have to worry about it. And if all you want is a, is a patent that's kind of slides through the office easily and quickly without expenditure of much time or money, you can have that, but you shouldn't then get a patent that has a strong presumption of validity. At the same time, it would be nice to give people the opportunity to actually get a more serious vetting from the patent office, get real consideration of the uh, pieces of prior art they consider important and give them a strong presumption of validity when they survive that review. Because uh, I think some patents are in the nature of lottery tickets 
people throw them in and they see what happens. But there are also patents that people understand going in are going to be critical to their business and they may actually want to pay more for the certainty of a, of a stronger review and a stronger presumption. Doesn't the existence now of the inequitable conduct doctrine suggest that there's already a good incentive for inventors and prosecutors to put all of that prior art in front of the patent office now? Um, uh, and uh, so your, your hypothetical concern that the patent office will then be clogged with prior art, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that the current uh, stick of the inequitable conduct doctrine might demonstrate that that, that concern might not be uh, uh, something that we ought to worry about too much. Um, your, your, your thoughts on that, or you, you think that the change you're talking about would really lead to uh, a, a new avalanche of prior art? Well, so I think it's a fair point, and I think it's right as to art that's already in the patent, in the applicant's possession. The real question is whether if we simply draw a line that says any art that made it to the patent office gets a strong presumption of validity, any art that didn't doesn't get a strong presumption of validity, maybe we now encourage people to go out and search for and then submit anything they can find that's even close in the field. Then that might or might not be a good thing. I, you know, maybe there are advantages to encouraging searching, which a lot of applicants currently don't do. Uh, but I think it's got to be coupled with some mechanism that gives the patent examiner, in the limited time they have, the ability to actually filter through these references. If in fact you go out and search and you submit hundreds of references. So, Mark, so this is a point where. Uh -huh. uh, your idea of rational ignorance would, would play in this, right? The, the, in talking about the resources that the patent office has to review these things and somehow dealing with this backlog of prior art, isn't that, isn't that where this, this idea would play into this uh, whole, whole picture? Yeah, I think that's right. It, we, we, we can't afford, we probably don't want to afford uh, perfect examination in the patent office for all of the patents out there because a lot of them are never going to be heard from again. <laughs> Uh, and so again, to me, the, the right way to think about it is, is there a way to, to modulate how much work is done to take the vast majority of patents or uh, whatever people choose to say, uh, I, I don't want a really expensive examination, I just want a cheap one, and say, fine, you can have that, but then you get... Uh, only a weak presumption of validity, and yet still give for a few people who think they really need the stronger examination and the stronger presumption of validity, give them that opportunity as well. So you would leave it up to the applicant to make that decision, Mark? We've, we're getting a couple of comments that along these lines from Nest of Robbins in IRC, who's worried about a result that um, leads to worthless patents um, he's hoping that the Supreme Court, of course, will consider the overall purpose of the patent system. And he wonders if we're going to eliminate the presumption of validity, why not just move to a registration system without a substantive examination? And that's essentially what you're saying in certain cases would happen? Well, I'm not sure I would go that far. Uh, I mean, I do think... There, I think uh, a lot of the examination that's happened in the last 15 years, particularly in the late 1990s, had some of the characteristics of a registration system. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, examiners in some cases were checking boxes, but they weren't actually uh, rejecting a large number of applications. And so I'm not sure that I want to go directly to a registration system because uh, worthless patents, when they make it into the litigation system, really do impose costs uh, on the on the rest of the world, but it's also important to recognize that we're never going to get rid of bad patents. Uh, there are always going to be some that make it through the cracks, and I think if we uh, ratchet back the presumption of validity, we make it somewhat easier to to eliminate those patents uh, when it comes to litigation, if and when they get litigated. So would that would that help the problem of uh, so many patent trolls? I, well, I think it would help. It would help in responding to patent trolls. I mean, the, the problem of patent trolls is a is a significant one, uh, and I think it comes in part out of the remedial structure of the patent system. Right, the possibility I could get before a jury and, and demand substantial damages. We've made some significant reforms to that remedial structure that have helped limit the problem. Uh, 
But the other part of the patent troll problem is a function of the high cost of patent litigation. If it's going to cost a defendant $5 million per, uh, per case to invalidate uh, a patent, even if it's pretty obviously a bad one, uh, then there's a business opportunity, which a lot of companies currently take advantage of, of filing suits uh, on patents no matter how weak they are, uh, and saying, well, pay me a million dollars and I'll go away, or pay your lawyers $5 million to get the same result. Well, this is a fascinating topic, and we, we could go on on patents for the whole show, but I think I'm going to let M. Locke in the chat room have the last word on it, and he says that patents were ruined by time tra travelers, so we all just have to <laughs> come yeah. to terms with that. Time travelers should have had U.S. patent number one if they knew what they were doing. That's right. Um, I, I want to move to uh, something pretty interesting and, and a lot of people think very disturbing that um, has happened in the last few weeks that we haven't gotten into in too much depth on the show. But uh, that is the U.S. Immigration and Customs Service, Customs Enforcement Service, um, going ahead and, and deciding that even though um, this COICA law has not been enacted, it doesn't need any further authority than what it already has to go ahead and seize and shut down various sites based on uh, their being able to take over the domain name. In fact, this happened on Cyber Monday. I don't know if there's some sort of strategic timing to all that. But uh, Eric, you've been paying attention to this. Uh, can, you, can you explicate it a bit for us and give us your thoughts? Yeah, it's a, there's a number of things here that concern me. I guess the first one is, was listening to John Morton, who's the Assistant Secretary uh, at Department of Homeland Security in charge of ICE, talking about intellectual property. He was giving remarks at what appeared to be a soundstage at the uh, Disney Studios in Burbank. And he said, um, he said, criminals are stealing American ideas and uh, American, here's the quote, Every day, seven days a week, criminals are stealing American ideas and products and distributing them over the Internet. Uh, ideas are really not protected by intellectual property. There's a little bit maybe of an exception for ideas for new toys in New York State. But, but uh, and then Eric Holder, in another thing related to intellectual property and ICE, he put in a press release said, the theft of ideas... Uh, ellipse, threatens economic opportunities and financial stability, suppresses innovation and destroys jobs. I, um, it, it just sounds to me like they don't have a real good grasp of what intellectual property is. I mean, intellectual property is, is complicated. It's not anybody who copies you or copies your ideas is infringing on intellectual property. We have a series of, of different doctrines which generally do not overlap which uh, protect very specific things. And time and time again, the Supreme Court has said that copying in general is okay, and copying in general is even a good thing for the economy. Um, so I'm, I'm worried by some of the rhetoric where uh, ICE uh, seems to be taking on this idea, thoroughly discredited by the Supreme Court and, and uh, most people who thought deeply about it, that just copying something or copying an idea uh, is somehow illegal and uh, hurtful uh, to the economy. That's, that's just not true, and, and, and that part troubles me. Um, the other part that's sort of mystifying about this, and there's been a lot of conversation about this on the cyber profs listserv, which Mark Lemley uh, either started or is in charge of uh, out there, which is a wonderful, uh, wonderful resource. But people are talking about how did ICE seize these uh, domains without any court process. And the first thing that seemed to occur to people, and, and I don't think it's what actually happened, but this idea that, well, are they saying that they're coming across borders? Because customs enforcement can and always has had the ability under the Constitution to seize things at the border. The Fourth Amendment really does not apply at the border when you're coming into the country. And even, even though that's certainly not the legal theory they used uh, to seize the, the websites, is nonetheless, you get this kind of a feeling of with immigrations and customs enforcement doing this, seizing these websites, is it, is it this sort of feeling that they can just grab things um, like they do at the border? Uh, day to day, ICE really doesn't have to worry about the Fourth Amendment or the Constitution very much, but 
Um, when you're taking uh, websites uh, inside the United States, all without uh, really any, certainly any, um, uh, what little process there is is ex parte and uh, very abbreviated. It's, it's, it's very worrying. So I think on, on constitutional grounds and rhetorical grounds, it seems very worrying to me. I will say that, you know, the people who are just throwing out copies of Disney movies, I have no sympathy for. I'm certainly not speaking up for them. But with the enforcement effort comes a lot of things that worry me. What about well, you, Mark? Are, are you behind uh, the, the Immigration and Custom, Customs Enforcement's actions here? And what do you think of COICA? So I, w the interesting thing about COICA is um, uh, the administration seems to be asking Congress for and has not yet received precisely the authority that they, um, they in the immigration enforcement context, have uh, arrogated to themselves. Uh, not clear why we would need COICA if the government's right that it can just go ahead and in, seize any of these websites whenever it wants. So, I, I mean... I, I want to echo Eric's last point. A lot of the sites targeted in these raids are sites that are pretty clearly promoting copyright infringement. That is illegal, uh, and it should be stopped. But I'm quite concerned about the mechanism by which it happens, both because of the lack of due process, right? This isn't the result of a lawsuit in which the government charged these folks with copyright infringement and prevailed in court and got the seizure of the domain as a remedy for that. Uh, the seizure seems to come before any actual court uh, proceeding. And second, uh, some of the sites that are being seized are things that are effectively search engines in the peer-to-peer -peer space, right? So Torrent Finder um, isn't itself, as I understand it, posting pirated information, uh, pirated content on the web. Uh, it's allowing you to search peer-to-peer -peer networks. Now, it's right to say a lot of the stuff on peer-to-peer -peer networks is infringing, but not all of it. And it's not that far a step from Torrent Finder to YouTube, where it's also right to say that a lot but not all of the material is uh, infringing, or Google and the internet as a whole. So the idea that the solution, if there's a website that is linking to some infringing and some non-infringing material, is not to weed out the uh, infringing material or go after the people who are infringing, but instead to seize the whole website and shut it down without due process, I think is quite worrisome for the internet. If you think about it in a context outside the United States, uh, right? imagine what our reaction would be if uh, the governments of Pakistan or Thailand or Italy um, started seizing American websites like YouTube or Facebook and shutting them down because, as, they, as those countries have all concluded, those websites violate local law. Right, and the only thing that prevents them from being able to do that is the happenstance of where various registries and registrars are located. Isn't that right? Right. I think that's right. And so, you know, for the dot-com domain, most of them tend to be located in the United States. That's great. But I don't think that's going to continue to be true. And for con for companies who want a global presence, right, you often end up dealing with uh, registries or registrars that are scattered across the globe. Absolutely. Hey, Evan, did you take a look at uh, the dangers of COICA and the thoughts of David Yulevich um, from Open DNS? I did. I did. And, um, you know, it, it, what he says there really seems to, to echo a lot of the concerns that, that, we've, that we've talked about before and the concerns that, that just tend to, to come very naturally uh, when all of this. And that, is, that, that really touches on a fundamental point at which I'm confused <laughs> uh, about this. And I'm confused not only when I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of COICA, at least COICA will make it explicit that, you know, the, the seizure of a domain name, or I guess more, more precisely, the blacklisting of a domain name falls under the legislative um, 
system. You know, it, 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 there's that authority that's that's provided for in that. But one thing that's confusing with me on on this notion of what happened on Cyber Monday is this relationship between the um, you know what uh, what Matt you know read there at the beginning. This notion of what the um, what the, the government was saying how everyday ideas are being um, you know, stolen over the web and traded ideas and goods, these things. Where is it that we can tie this relationship between the alleged theft of these things that these crooks, you know, to use the government's language, uh, are doing with the seizure of a domain name? You know, the, the Customs Enforcement Authority goes toward, you know, intercepting things, uh, you know, counterfeit goods, for example, at the, the border. How does that, where do, how do we uh, analytically draw the line between connecting the dots between the sale of those things and the seizure of the of the domain names, especially when there are already provisions in the law that allow for, uh, you know, the seizure of goods that are trying to be imported into the, the country and the, the DMCA. And that's one of the points you're raised in this article that you're talking about here, uh, Denise, with the open from the open DNS guy. There's mm -hmm. the DMCA that's already there to provide a mechanism, a very powerful you know, often criticized mechanism because of how easy it is for content owners to to invoke. You know, wh how is it that domain names get involved in all this? That's where I'm kind of uh, confused at a very fundamental threshold point in in all of this analysis. That's my thought yeah. on on open D on the DNS part of it. That's that's why my you know pretext radar goes off that there's you know an agenda here that is using whatever tools are available. And if those tools are simply the geographic location of the registries and registrars, then hey, they're going to go ahead and use it. Um, and I just don't know that that's, that's a right way to make decisions about infringement enforcement. Um, yeah, Mark, I agree. The been, creep out factor here is pretty, the, the creep out factor here is pretty high. I mean, this is, uh, and, and Evan, I think, pointed to one way in which COICA seems to be different from what ICE has already done. Uh, 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 on Cyber Monday, which is that COICA sort of allows for this blacklisting of websites, which sounds really like something China would do. And just mm -hmm. makes me really uncomfortable. I just hate to see the United States of America saying, uh, sending out an order to a bunch of ISPs that says, you're not allowed to transmit anything under this domain name. It's just, it's just creepy. Right. I mean, Absolutely. it's a little bit, I mean, the best analog that I can come up with is a little bit like what Spam House does, you know, for, um, you know, keep, keeping spam off the system. And that, you know, that gets criticized for its own merits. And, and that's not even close to, you know, governmental action. So it, it, it uh, you, you hit the nail right on the head by identifying it as a creep out factor. That's, that's a real good way of putting it. And let me, let me add the following, which is that the, the, even if the websites that are currently being targeted look like they're ones that are primarily directed at piracy, uh, the history of technology uh, in the media space is one in which uh, a lot of sites and a lot of technologies that start out looking like a primarily pirate technology end up being uh, of extraordinary importance to us, right? So imagine if we'd had a similar uh, doctrine in the 1920s that allowed the seizure of uh, pirate radio because uh, all radio was pirate radio in the 19 teens and 1920s, right? That seized the spectrum and shut it down because it was being used to infringe music copyrights. My fear is that if we end up seizing websites early, if we never let them actually litigate the question of whether their technology is legal, we end up shutting down a potentially viable technology and we literally never know what we were missing. Those must have been fun days of pirate radio back in the, the teens and the 20s. That, that would have been cool. Did you see the movie? It was no, pretty good. No, yeah. I, I Is that the it. one? That, yeah, I know what you're, what you're talking about. I haven't seen the, it. The one about the uh, the British pirate radio station. That off, was off the shores. Uh, off the yeah. shores, yes. It was, yeah. it was uh, entertaining. Um, Mark, you've been to a couple of events uh, around the Palo Alto and San Francisco areas that I'd love to have you report in on after we take a break and thank our sponsor here in just a moment. That would be the SF Music Tech Copyright Panel and also uh, WIPO came to Stanford recently. So I'd love to get your thoughts on those couple of developments. But in the meantime, 
I want to uh, encourage everyone to go check out MailRoute. Businesses of every size use MailRoute. You could have one user or 50,000 users, doesn't matter. MailRoute will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life, and make your email usable again. It's a secure hosted service that filters virus and spam for companies of any size. Uh, whether you're a single user or a company with tens of thousands of employees, MailRoute can eliminate your viruses and spam, reduce the load on your email server, lower your costs, and make your email usable again. Typical MailRoute customers see a 95% reduction in their inbound email volume with virtually no false positives. Think about that 95% of the stuff coming in is spam, ouch. Um, Leo on our network here loves MailRoute. He's been using it for um, more than six years and it's been his top choice for spam and virus filtering all along. Tom Merritt, also of our Twit network, started using MailRoute and now he can use email domains that he'd given up on being able to use as hopeless. Um, something that had gotten too spam rid ridden now he can use comfortably. Um, Tom Johnson, who's the founder and CEO of MailRoute, started one of the very first companies in this market back in 1998, Frontbridge. Um, so there's nothing easier for mail filtering than MailRoute. Visit MailRoute.info to sign up. As a Twill listener, you'll receive a 10% discount for the life of your account. Small business accounts start at $2 per user per month for every 10 users. And because of demand from the Twit Army, MailRoute has added a new service for individual users as well, less than $30 per user per year for single users. Visit MailRoute.info and sign up with the email filtering service that Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte both use. Thank you, MailRoute, for sponsoring the show. And Mark, you were on the copyright panel at the SF Music Tech Conference. Tell us about that. What was on everybody's minds there? Right. So the first thing to note, uh, which I, I have to say I think is a bad sign, is that as far as I can tell, the copyright panel was the best attended panel at the conference. Um, and it can't be a good sign for innovation if the thing that's on the minds of all of the uh, people developing new technologies in the music space is, what about copyright law? Um, the One of the most interesting discussions we had at the panel was the question of whether it's better to seek forgiveness or permission uh, as a new technology or a, or a new website. Uh, there was a lively debate on that question. I, I'll tell you where I came down, which is that uh, there are so many copyright owners out there and the rights are divided in such uh, surprising uh, ways uh, that companies who decide to wait and seek permission from everybody in the content space before they launch their site uh, often never end up getting to the launch point. Uh, so I, you know, I think the right strategy uh, as a new technology company is get your technology out there, start proving its worth, don't ignore the content industries. I think at the same time, you want to be trying to, to engage uh, content owners, uh, but uh, the track record of folks who've waited to get legal permissions for everything they might need to do in the new music space has not been an encouraging one. Was there a lot of talk about streaming? So you know, there was some discussion of streaming. I, so one of the, one of the questions, um, the, so we, we divide the rights in all sorts of interesting ways in copyright law that, that make life difficult for new technology companies on the internet. Um, and one of the ways we divide the rights is between music publishers and uh, the recording industry. Uh, but another way we divide the rights is by splitting up the right to uh, make copies, the right to uh, public performance, the right to distribution. Uh, and one of the difficulties with things like um, streaming technologies is deciding whether or not uh, it fits into one of those boxes or potentially more than one of those boxes because if we call it a public performance, one set of people needs to get paid. If we call it a distribution, a different set of people need to get paid. And if we say there are copies being made uh, during the course of that performance or distribution, yet a third set of folks need to get paid. Right. So the reason I asked the question is it, it seems to me that that's the direction that music services are inevitably moving here, that you, you still have download services out there. And of course, um, there's a thriving P2P and BitTorrent universe. 
Uh, but things like Pandora, I think, are swooping in. And um, what is what is the service that uh, we don't get here in the U.S. but the Europeans all love? I'm spacing Spotify. On the name right now. Yes, Spotify. Spotify. Um, so I, I mean, they seem seem to me like the wave of the future for um, music and copyright law. And it, it you know, uh, granted the considerations that Mark just mentioned, they do um, shift the whole arena away sort of uh, from user infringement and to, you know, how the service is going to uh, make sure that all of the licensing is um, lined up and, and properly in place and the royalties are, are settled and then they're off and running. Um, Eric, what do you think about this? Uh, d d is the plane of engagement shifting here? Well, I think I think what uh, Mark said is is absolutely true that it makes more sense to go ahead and ask for forgiveness later. Uh, sadly, and that's a, it's a good it's 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 refreshing to hear such a, a real uh, real life perspective from a law professor. And I know uh, I know Mark does uh, is a practicing lawyer as well. But um, and uh, in a sense, uh, I I think that's kind of a shame. Um, one thing that uh, tends to happen is, uh, you know, and it, Congress has its problems uh, in terms of trying to satisfy special interests. But one thing that you see with the courts is when it comes time for someone to ask forgiveness, if they are, for instance, I'll just take a random example, Google with the book search, uh, they get all kinds of uh, 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 credit for um, uh, I mean, they they have the they have the wind at their back, and and uh, then you have something uh, with the Google Book Search settlement that's just limited to a particular company, Google. Uh, on uh, some of the terms are are secret, and that that whole thing's still up in the air. But um, uh, it, it, I think uh, while Congress has its troubles, uh, when people go ahead and do things with dubious legality and and wait to sort it out later, and especially when it becomes settled and it's a class action thing, then you get the development of the law that I think is uh, can be very very unfortunate. So. You know, the big problem with intellectual property law, it really is that there's too much of it. I mean, if we dialed back uh, uh, patent terms and dialed back copyright terms and dialed back some of these some of these rights, uh, we wouldn't be having so many of these problems, frankly. Evan, what's your uh, music service of choice these days? Uh, YouTube. YouTube. You <laughs> well, I mean, you well, know, I guess that's copyright's just the way you... still an issue then. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you can go and uh, I listen to Last FM quite a bit. Uh, you know, Pandora, of course, and uh, you know, that, there's nothing too sophisticated with the way I'm the way I'm doing things. You know, I'm kind of a musical grazer. I go into different moods and different listen to different things at different times. So there really is, you know, despite the tools we have for customization and interactivity, it's there. There still is not yet the perfect solution for the way I listen to music and 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 want to uh, want to consume it. Um, but if, if I could pick up on what Eric said about there being too many laws, you know, dealing with, with intellectual property there, and that's one of the problems, um, you know, I like the way that sounds. And, and I'm wondering if it's really just a different way of articulating maybe the um, underdeveloped or at least the con perennially uncertain contours of fair use because when uh, you know when mark was was talking about this whole you know better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission it seems like the default setting is to rely on fair use if we're confining the discussion to just a copyright thing here and and i'm presented with so many ideas uh, you know from clients and prospective clients who are wanting to do innovative things with content collection and aggregation and redistribution and display in in ways that that technologically just never cease to really just blow my mind in the way that they're thinking of, of, of new things here. And we just have such such limited guidance when it comes to these principles of, of fair use. Yeah, we've got the, the, those four factors that we look at, you know, quant, um, you know co codified, and we've got plenty of, of authority, but there, you, you can't think about fair use without realizing how very context specific it is. And because of that, it does a very terrible job as a doctrine of giving us much information and in how we should counsel people who are wanting to be innovators and wanting to, to, to do things. And the unfortunate thing is that there really is a big abysmal downside if when you ask
ask for forgiveness if the court doesn't come out your way, especially if you're dealing with a, uh, you know, a very aggressive and, and um, well-heeled uh, opponent coming from, uh, you know, the, on the other side of the aisle. So um, I don't, you know, they, that seems to be somewhere, you know, along this spectrum of what, uh, Eric, you're talking about having less intellectual property uh, rights or guidance or, or however you articulated that, too much intellectual property law. Um, I, I'm wondering, and, and it, it seems to it seems that it goes along with this this whole question of, in proportion to that, it would be nice if there were more guidance on what fair use really means and, and use that's not you know one of those 106 rights. So Larry Lessig famously said, um, "Fair use is the right to hire a lawyer." Uh, mm -hmm. And it's sufficiently uncertain uh, that that's all you get. Uh, and it's right to say, as Evan points out, um, if you're in the digital music technology business, because of the structure of things like statutory damages, every case is a bet the company case. Right? If you lose, your damages liability will be so great that it will shut down your technology. On the other hand, not as a legal matter, but as a practical matter, one of the reasons I think uh, to go ahead and launch uh, and to negotiate after launch rather than uh, instead of launch is that uh, companies that have made it to a certain size or scale that have proved out the value of their technology uh, then often find themselves much more insulated from liability than startups that haven't made it there yet. Uh, so uh, I think Eric mentioned uh, Google and Book Search, which is an example. Uh, the uh, you know, the fact that Google is already sufficiently large, I think, gives it um, uh, not a legal difference, but a practical uh, difference uh, in the minds of a lot of people. It's hard to imagine, for example, shutting down YouTube, even though Viacom has asked the court to do exactly that, because YouTube has made it sufficiently, uh, is made it sufficiently in, the, in the marketplace that they're a feature. Uh, a great example to me is uh, Replay TV, the very first uh, DVR, which the copyright owners sued and drove into bankruptcy, uh, compared with TiVo, which for some reason they didn't file a parallel lawsuit. TiVo got large enough uh, that I think now it would be inconceivable that a court, uh, no matter how it found the uh, fair use factors to go, uh, concluding that TiVo was illegal. Um, you know, TiVo got successful enough, it got known well enough that now, even though a bunch of copyright owners probably would love to shut it down, uh, or at least to demand modifications from it, they're not going to be able to do so. So I, I think... So I think one of the advantages of uh, getting your technology out there is if you can get it adopted, if you can show the promise of the technology well enough, uh, you may influence both the courts but also the copyright owners uh, to see the value in that technology. That'll, that'll work if lawyers can also be authorized to write prescriptions for Valium or Xanax for their clients <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty laid back dude and a lot of the uh, clients that I work with are, are pretty, you know, laid back. But man, this stuff, you know, when it is the bet the company uh, place that you're putting yourself in there, this, it's not easy to sleep at night worrying about these things. And it's just so unfortunate how it gets in the way of, of creative and, and energetic innovation with these things. So, you know... Yeah. That's, a, so that's, a great, that's a great point. And it's uh, one other thing to emphasize on that, which is the content owners over the last decade or so have done their best to bring that risk home to new technology companies. So they've done things like suing uh, the people who run those companies in their personal capacity rather than mm -hmm. just suing the corporation or suing venture capitalists for investing in uh, technology companies uh, with which in turn facilitate piracy. So I, I think that copyright owners have, you know, tried very hard to send a message that, uh, you know, new technology is not welcome in this space unless it's technology we've already blessed. Um, but I think that's a really corrosive message for innovation. Yeah, for sure. Mark, I mean, was listen, any of just this... A... Sorry. Sorry. 
It's just a, it, listening to what Evan's saying. It's just, I mean, listen to it. He's talking about how intellectual property laws are getting in the way of innovation and creativity. I mean, just take a step back and listen to Evan talking as a practicing attorney about the grand tragedy of this. The whole idea of intellectual property law is supposed to be to spur creative and innovative activity. And here we are. We're talking about how it is absolutely getting in the way. It's, right. it's, so it's, that's it's what, sad. That's what I was going to ask Mark. It seems to me like uh, we have this tension between that reality and what might have been on the minds of the folks at WIPO when they came to Stanford and shared their thoughts recently. Um, it, it, Mark, am I right in assuming that uh, perhaps their take on things might be a bit different? Well, yes. I, I mean, I think the, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the UN organization that, that manages intellectual property, uh, I think very much sees its job as evangelization of intellectual property, particularly into, uh, into countries that have less developed IP regimes. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things they hope to do is harmonize various intellectual property laws to make it easier to cross national boundaries. I think that's a laudable goal. It's one that's been a goal for a long time and we haven't made a lot of progress towards, at least on the patent side, things are a little better on the copyright and trademark sides. Um, but I do, I, I do think one of the things that was notable about the, the WIPO conference that we held at Stanford um, was sort of how far we are away from a kind of true international intellectual property system and how small the steps we're taking are uh, to get there. All right, so uh, as we wind down to the end of our last show of the year, I uh, wanted to get all of your thoughts, and Eric, we'll start with you, on what you think uh, the most important or significant tech law development of 2010 has been. Uh, wow, huh? I, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. You know what? I, I made a note to myself to, uh, that you were probably going to ask me that question and come up with something. <laughs> I guess, you know, I guess I think that the most significant tech law development has been things that have not been in the law, but things that have been in practice and have become ingrained in practice. I think we saw this year, uh, Google Books and YouTube get big enough and ingrained enough that they become, that they have become, in, in all, for all practical purposes, insulated from uh, attack uh, through litigation. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's a very realist perspective. Uh, and it's not technically a legal development, but it, it's changed the, the actual effect of the legal landscape. And I guess that's what I'd pick. Mark, there's certainly been a lot that has happened this year. Is there anything that stands out in your mind as uh, particularly interesting or significant? Well, yeah, I, I want to identify something we actually haven't talked about, which is trademark law. Uh, mm -hmm. There were a number of developments uh, in 2010 that made life a little bit safer for Internet companies uh, from trademark liability. The European Court of Justice, uh, in a keyword advertising case against Google, actually limited Google's liability, reversing the French cases that had concluded that Google was liable whenever somebody put up an advertisement uh, opposite a search for a trademarked term. Um, in the United States, there's been a number of kind of moves back and forth on legal doctrines, but it remains the case that uh, nobody's ever held a search engine liable for keyword advertising. Uh, and then perhaps most significantly uh, for technology companies, the Tiffany versus eBay decision, um, where the Second Circuit made it clear that uh, just because you run an online marketplace in which people could be selling counterfeit material, uh, you aren't automatically liable uh, if you, as long as you take reasonable steps to identify uh, and get rid of counterfeit uh, auctions, uh, you can go ahead and run a site without fear of potentially crippling copyright or trademark liability. Yeah, that's, that's a great way for the folks who run those sites to be able to sleep better at night and a welcome development. Uh, for me, I, th I think I reach back to June and Judge Lewis Stanton and how surprised and uh, anxious I was to read through his decision 
when uh, he, the trial court judge uh, back in New York, threw out the billion dollar case by Viacom et al. against YouTube and Google, um, which we've just had the appeal filed in that case. So it still labors along through the courts. But uh, if Judge Stanton's ruling stands, then uh, the DMCA and its safe harbors have uh, been vindicated. And um, it's really been, uh, it, it, it was a stunning and early end to um, what was probably the biggest piece of copyright, copyright litigation pending in the country. Um, so that's my uh, contribution as the most interesting and significant development of 2010. Evan, do you have one? I've said before that I thought it was a big year for the First Amendment with, you know, anonymity and privacy and uh, some of this other stuff. But here's another thing I'd like to to make an observation on. And I don't know if this is so much a new development in things or if it's just maybe that I'm starting to notice things like these as I mature as a commentator, so to speak, on, on these types of issues. But it's this. It's the rise in the focus more on norms and less on the law as providing mechanisms for handling these problems that arise in the community that is the, the internet and the World Wide Web. Two poignant examples just from recent months. Uh, WikiLeaks, the anonymous, you know, and we talked about this in the last show, you know, anonymous with a capital A, the 4chan kind of folks, and the backlash of, uh, you know, going after those who were against WikiLeaks, and then also the Cook's Source stuff from a few weeks ago, the backlash, the mob mentality that goes on uh, when somebody call someone to the mat on, uh, you know, with, with, you know, engaging in misconduct. It's those extra legal, extra judicial kind of self-help uh, things that happened when communities in, uh, kind of appear spontaneously and take action to confront a perceived uh, grievance that has happened in this community at large. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to end with our last tip of the week and resource of the week for the year, um, the tip is going to come courtesy of Mark Lemley, uh, who has done a report on um, the best venue to file a patent suit. You want to um, tell us a bit about that, Mark? Uh, sure. So I, uh, I did a study of uh, all patent lawsuits filed in the country in the last 11 years um, and looked at things like how likely is the plaintiff to win, but also how likely is the case to get to trial? How quickly will the case go? Uh, and, you know, different jurisdictions do better in different uh, uh, measures. Uh, overall, the most surprising findings, the Eastern District of Texas, which is the plaintiff's forum of choice in the middle of the of the last decade, um, no longer makes the top five, I think largely because it's slowed down as a venue um, and uh, also because defendants actually do surprisingly well there pre-trial. Uh, the District of Delaware is a very strong choice for patent plaintiffs, but the number one place to file your patent case, uh, based on my study, uh, is Disneyland the Middle District of Florida. <laughs> there we go. All right, good to know. A couple of resources of the week to toss out for you. Jonathan Zittrain over at Harvard has done an amazing WikiLeaks FAQ. Um, so if you have any questions at all about what leaky WikiLeaks is, what happened, why it's so much in the public eye, he has a long litany of questions that he goes through and analyzes um, and has some great insights. And this is at his blog, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. And actually I'll throw one last resource in there via Burke, our producer in the studio who sent me the link. Actually, I think this might have come from one of the chatters um, from Psychology Today of all things. We were talking about norms, Evan, and uh, how they shade the law. And this is um, an article about uh, yes, it came from the IRC. Uh, five reasons why 500 million people are on Facebook. What lessons for psychology? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Titus, thank you, in IRC gave us this. And it's really interesting to consider. Um, the You can go and read it yourself. Uh, I'll throw it into our discussion points for the show. But uh, the things they toss out are because so many people are bored at work, because too many people are unhappy about their love life, because there are too many narcissists and even more voyeurs in the world, uh, because one of the main human motives is the desire to get along. 
And number five, because the other main motive is to get ahead. Um, so interesting motivations about why people may be online from the psychiatric, psychological point of view. Uh, and with that, I'm going to wish you all a really wonderful rest of the holiday season and a great new year. Uh, Evan, it's been a really fun year doing the show with you. Thanks so much for all your contributions. Well, thank you. It's, uh, I say this a lot, but that's uh, definitely a high point of the week. So I appreciate the invitation back uh, week after week. Thank you so much. It's uh, my pleasure and uh, really the high point of my week too, especially when we can have such great thinkers and commentators as the esteemed Mark Lemley on the show. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really, really fun. I'm sure that uh, folks are going to love hearing your thoughts. Uh, Mark, where can uh, people reach you off the show? I know you're on Twitter. Uh, I am on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Uh, uh, email uh, at uh, Stanford, um, mlemley at law.stanford.edu, uh, which you see in your uh, screen. Uh, and the law firm of San Francisco uh, is uh, Dury Tongri. Great, Dury Tongri. And you're M. Lemley on Twitter, correct? Uh, I am Mark Lemley on Twitter. Mark Lemley on Twitter, great. Uh, thank you so much. It's been really fun. And Eric, it's been great having you back on the show. You are Eric E. Johnson on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yes, yes. It's been a blast, Denise. Thank you. And if people want to get in touch with me, the absolute best way is in person. Come to North Dakota, wear something very warm. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. You're, I'm sure that you're looking forward to a white Christmas. I, oh, it's already. We're guaranteed a white Christmas. It's very white already. That's fabulous. All right. Well, Eric, uh, so fun to chat with you. And uh, this has been a great way to round out Quill 2010. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening to the show. We'll see you in the new year. Take care.